Morning. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate you in attendance. Apologize for no video for this sermon, but hopefully there will be audio at least until I can get that taken care of. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished in all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Jesus would say, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, and verse 48. Paul would say in Romans 2 and verse 16 that the world will be judged according to my gospel. God's word is the standard by which we are to live. Romans 3, 19. Whatsoever the law saith, it saith to them under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all may stand guilty before God. The law speaks to those under the law, and our law is Jesus' words. His gospel, that's our standard. Paul would preach that very gospel everywhere he went. So we're back in the study of in every church. 1 Corinthians 4, 17, Paul preached the same thing in every church. Chapter 7, verse 17, he ordained the same thing in all the churches. Paul taught the same gospel. The same gospel revealed by God, Galatians 1, 12. The same gospel that he preached faithfully, Romans 15, 18. For I dare not speak of any things, save those which Christ wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient in word and deed. And he did so, and, and in so doing, he fully preached the gospel, Romans 15, 19. So Paul preached the one and only gospel. And he taught it everywhere he went, and the result was one church everywhere. Paul taught a consistent gospel in Romans. And in 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians. In the letters to Thessalonica, he wrote the same gospel. In the letters to Timothy, he is ordaining the same things to this evangelist to teach this pure gospel. 1st Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 3 is the text this morning. If you will open your Bibles to that text, we will begin. <clears throat> Please make sure that you have a Bible. If you don't, I have an extra one, or you can use this one. <clears throat> there are handouts, but my handouts are inadequate and worthless as it relates to God's inspired Word. The text says this, Forbidding to marry <clears throat> and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received <clears throat> excuse me, with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. What are you talking about, Paul? Verse 1 and 2 of 1 Timothy 4 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats. So it's a continuation in thought from verses 1 and 2. Paul is talking about individuals who are practicing apostasy. That is, those who were once sound and faithful will go on and digress into error. And these are some of the things that they will prevalently teach. We looked at uh, the, the speaking lies and hypocrisy last uh, two weeks ago. We looked at having a conscience seared, that is, uh, being hardened through sin. But there would be some who would teach forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. And these might seem like trivial matters. But God would say through Moses to the nation of Israel as they were prepared to cross the Jordan and he would not. He would say, add thou not unto the word of God and take not aught from it. Deuteronomy 4. Proverbs writer would say in Proverbs 30 and verse 6, do not add unto the word of God. Revelation 22, 18 and 19, he would say it once again. Do not add to the prophecies of this book and take not away from. We have no right whatsoever to add a jot or tittle to God's word or to remove anything from it. God's word is the authority, the standard, not our thoughts. So, any binding or loosing of God's obligations is sinful, period. We cannot. Psalm 119, verse number 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. We can't change it, right? So if God says this, that's it. 
We can't say, oh, that's okay. You don't really have to do that. Or God said, don't do this. Oh, it's really okay. We can do that anyway. God was talking to them then. It's okay for us now. You better have a good explanation for that. And it better be in harmony with God's word. Otherwise, you're in trouble. Some of those who would depart from the faith would be hypocrites, binding things that should not be bound. Folks do it today. <clears throat> there are folks who tell you that God says it's a sin for you to uh, allow your children at your home to paint eggs and to hide them on a certain weekend in April. They would say that a certain day in December would be sinful to exchange gifts or to have a decorative tree in your house. Easter and Christmas have no religious significance whatsoever because the only one who can assign religious significance is the Father of Spirits, God Himself. And God has given no such significance to either one of those days. They are man-made holidays and therefore can be observed in a secular way. As long as the person understands that there is no religious connotation to it. I can't say that Jesus' well, birth was on December 25th and therefore celebrate it in a religious way because I don't have the authority to do so and neither can you. But there are those who would say that if you uh, uh, do these things in a secular way, that is not in a religious sense at all that you are sinning. That is binding where God is not bound. There are folks in the brotherhood who would tell you that from the church treasury we can't help a non-Christian. There are folks who would tell you that if a starving orphan walked into this building, that you and I could pass a, a, a plate, as it were, around out of our own pockets, but we couldn't take a, a dollar from the church treasury to help them. I'll tell you right now, that is contrary to the entire tenor of New Testament Christianity. Jesus would give a parable of a certain individual who fell among the wayside and a priest and a Levite come by and they passed the other way. But a Samaritan who had no dealings with Jews, they would come and he would put him up and put him in an inn and he would pour in wine and oil and he would provide for him everything that he needed. And at the end of this parable, he would say, who of those was neighborly unto this? And he said, he that showed mercy. And he said, go thou and do likewise. That is anyone who can be offered mercy, offer mercy. Not just this guy and not just this guy. Binding where God has not bound is sinful. Just as liberals loose where God has bound is also sinful. All right. Let's keep going. Forbidding to marry. Some folks, if you're on Facebook, be careful, right? If you're on social media, be careful because there are a lot of folks out there that don't know what they're doing or they do know what they're doing and they do it anyway. And they tell you lies because they want you to follow them and praise them and give them glory and say, oh, this guy's so smart. This guy said I could do this. Do you know that I've seen, I, I've spoken with individuals on, on those platforms for years and years and years ago, I remember having a conversation with a certain lady about marriage and she had revealed to me that, well, uh, her and her original spouse broke up and then she found the love of her life and she married him and that couldn't be wrong but we discussed it and showed that it was wrong because obviously if there was no fornication then there she was still bound in the first marriage well then she found a certain guy and i don't mind telling you who it is his name's robert waters and ivy connor they both teach error on marriage divorce and remarriage they teach that if you're put away and you're the guilty you can remarry again and they use this verse to try to to advocate that you're forbidding to marry. You're doing wrong if we actually stand on the premises of Matthew 19.9. No. 1 Timothy 4.3 doesn't contradict Matthew 19.9. Whosoever putteth away his wife, except to be fornication, and marrieth another, committeth adultery. Now, what's difficult about that? We may not like it, but it's still there. And whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. Is Paul saying, hey, you can't forbid marriage in any circumstance? You want to go that route? Anybody want to go there? Nod? Uh-uh? Yeah? Would you, would you uh, object to me uh, saying you can't marry a man if you're a man? Oh, that's different. Why? God's not going to join two eligible persons. God's not going to join an eligible woman 
to an ineligible man, and he's not going to join an, in, an ineligible man to an ineligible man. You can't join man and man, and you can't join woman and man if they're not eligible. It's just as wrong, and God's not going to do either. So don't tell me, oh, obviously you could uh, object to that. No, you could object to any of them that aren't scriptural. What about that fellow in India that married his goat? Anyone object to that? Some things are obvious, aren't they? And then when you think about it, the things that aren't quite as obvious, oh, you know what? You're right. Oh, I know I'm right. Not because of me, but because of God's Word. Listen, whosoever putteth away his wife and marries another commits adultery. You know what Luke does? Luke gives you the rule. You know there's only one guy that gives you the exception, Matthew. Luke says, any subsequent marriage is adultery. Whosoever puts away his wife and marries, adul uh, marries another is adultery, period, he says. The only difference in Matthew and Luke is that Matthew gives the exception and Luke doesn't. That doesn't mean that it's a contradiction. It just meant Luke's purpose was different. He's saying, look, Jesus, I heard him say this. This is what it is. Any subsequent marriage is adultery. And that's the rule. But there's one exception. Except to be for fornication. If you put away your spouse for fornication and you marry an eligible person, that is not adultery. If I have a spouse that dies while married to this person, I am now free to marry another. Romans 7, 4 through 6. If I have never married anyone in my life and an eligible woman comes around, I am eligible to marry her. Three instances in which marriage is approved. Never been married before, a widow or a widower of a lawful marriage, or the innocent who has put away the guilty for fornication. If you don't fall on those three, you better do some serious thinking. 1 Corinthians 7, 10 and 11. And unto the married I command, yea, not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. Let me ask you a question. You guys can probably see that. That's not too small. Eddie won't yell at me too bad for that one. This last phrase here. But if she depart, let her remain unmarried. Everybody know what unmarried means? It's kind of self-explanatory, right? It's axiomatic. Okay. What about husband? Everybody know what husband means? Can she be unmarried and also have a husband at the same time in the same sense, literally? Yes or no? Nope. So do we understand accommodative language? If she has a husband, she's not unmarried. But the perception is she's what? She's unmarried. The perception is she's not habitating with this man, therefore she's unmarried. But the reality is she's still got a husband. Because if, they, they just, if she just left for reasons other than fornication, she's got, no, she's got no right to ever marry again, and neither does he. They've got two options, remain like that or come back together and reconcile. Matthew 19, 9 doesn't contradict Luke 16, 8, which doesn't contradict 1 Corinthians 7, 10, and 11, which doesn't contradict 1 Timothy 4, 3. Forbidding to marry is not talking about where Scripture forbids marriage or God forbids marriage. Forbidding to marry, uh, forbidding to marry is relative to those who are eligible and people would forbid them. And I'm going to give you an example in just a moment. As... They believe us to be an error for affirming the Bible truth that those put away cannot remarry. Can a put away fornicator ever remarry? Let me ask you a question. If you're put away from fornication and your spouse dies, what changes? Oh, the spouse is dead now. The law is broken. Well, you know what? You are ineligible then because you were a put away fornicator. What changes when, she, when he or she dies? Nothing. Nothing changes. You're still a put away fornicator. And you still have no right to remarry. Innocent. Still married. Still lawfully married. Still habitating together. Still loving each other. They die. Absolutely. A widow. A widower. Yes. A person never been married before. Yes. The innocent party. Yes. The guilty party. No. The heirs... This error regards forbidding marriage to those who obviously were eligible. Celibacy, right? Who teaches celibacy? You know I'm not afraid to name names. Catholics, the Catholic Church teaches celibacy. There are probably some other denominational concepts that teach it also. 
piety. Hey guys, we think we think you could be more pious if you devote yourself wholly to the Lord and you're not distracted in any ways through marriage. Well, you know, Paul mentions this in 1 Corinthians 7, but it's interesting that Paul mentions this and says, the Lord doesn't command, but I give my judgment. And he says, I judge that in a difficult time, and he's in a context of the persecution they're facing. If you look at 1 Corinthians 7, there's some interesting questions concerning virgins. And, and Paul specifically touches on things written to him. There was persecution coming. And he says, look, here's my judgment. Because of the persecution, if you're single, just stay that way. Don't seek out a wife because if you do, there's going to be some hardships. And he says, if you're married, just stay that way. Don't seek to put them away. You know, just deal with things as they come. That's the point. Paul isn't making a blanket statement saying, oh, if you're not, if you're not married, don't ever get married. Obviously, that's not true. So when a man comes along and says, you know what, I think I could be a better servant to God, single, you're actually disagreeing with God. Anybody, everybody get that? Watch. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. You know when he said this? After he had already created every animal on earth. Actually, after Adam had come and he had sat there and all these animals came before him and he looked at each one and he named them. And you know who was there probably? Puppy dogs. I love puppy dogs, don't you? Man's best friend, but guess what? A dog is no substitute for a wife. And a dog's not good enough. Man is at his very best with his godly Wife. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. There is a closeness and a unity and a love and a devotion and a faithfulness in a marriage, or there should be, that transcends any other save that which God has for us. It's an incredible blessing and it's an incredible privilege that some of us are not able to enjoy. So when we're talking about forbidding to marry, we're not talking about forbidding lawful what Scripture says, no, you can't do that. They're talking about forbidding eligible marriages for their own reasons of ignorance. These are the same guys that says, hey, you can't eat that. To abstain from meat. So let me ask you a question. What food is unlawful for us today? And I want you to show me some scripture when I get done. Which one? None of them. Oh, you can eat pork today. Oh, contraire. You can't eat shellfish. You know that lady jumped all over me that time that I made a, a post on a public uh, a newspaper article about homosexuality? Oh, you Bible thumpers, you're such hypocrites. You shouldn't be eating shellfish. I said, lady, you don't know what you're talking about because I'm not an Israelite. You didn't know? That's not talking to you. You know what Johnny Robertson would say? Why are you reading other people's mail? That's not talking to you. That wasn't written to you. Did you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, if you want to turn there. Did you know that a Christian in first century Palestine or in first century Asia Minor could eat meat that was wholly committed to idolatry? Did you know that? Listen. As concerning therefore the eating of those things which are offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one for Though there be many called gods, where in heaven or on earth, as there be many gods and lords many. But to us there is but one God, the Father of all, whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Howbeit there is not in this uh, man every uh, not in every man this knowledge, for some with conscience of idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, see what they would do in Corinth, is they would have uh, marketplaces and they would have these idolatrous places and these idolatrous feasts 
and these dedications in these temples, and they would offer certain meats to idols. And then the leftovers they would take to the market and they'd sell. So if you're in Corinth and the guy there, he's a, maybe a new Christian, and he buys this market and he's like, man, you know what, I don't know if we should eat this or not because I bought this at the market and I'm pretty sure it came from old Diana's temple over there in Ephesus. We probably shouldn't eat it. Guess what you shouldn't do then? Don't eat it. But if they bought it and said, hey, we got some uh, pork tenderloin here, guys. Let's sit down and eat. Oh, wasn't that offered to Diana? Who cares? Diana's nothing. She's a statue. Oh, you're right. Let's eat. Nothing wrong with it. You can eat that. It's perfectly fine. So don't tell me that just because something's origin is paganism, if an individual knows better that they can't partake, that's exactly what it teaches. Now, what's the difference in observing Christmas in a secular way? Question. Nothing. There's not one difference. It, or, it, it, it has origins in paganism, doesn't it? Yeah? So does Thursday. So does Saturday. So does January. So does Mercury, the planet. So does Saturn, the planet. You, you get what I'm saying? Almost all of these things have origins and things that can be traced back to idolatry and paganism. You going to stop using the word Thursday? You going to stop taking Saturday off because your boss is You better work Saturday. Don't you observe that day. Foolishness. Why, why can't we just be consistent and reasonable? You can eat a meat offered to idol. That's no problem. As long as it doesn't violate your conscience or as long as you don't offend a weaker brother. You know what else you could do? You could eat any meat on earth, even those which the law of Moses forbade. Did you know that? Yeah. Listen. Acts chapter 10. You know what this is? Peter is seeing this vision. He's in Joppa. And he's about to go to Cornelius' household. And God shows him this vision. And I saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him which, uh, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God has cleansed, that call not thou common. You know what's interesting? is that this is a few years after the day of Pentecost and Peter's still keeping the dietary concepts as a custom. Peter, well, he knew he wasn't under this law, but he's always done this and he was continuing to, to keep these dietary standards. But God says something interesting, and again, it's for inclusion of Gentiles in the church, but he says something interesting. He's like, this is now clean to you. Gentiles can come into the church just as you could rise, kill, and eat. And again, he's, he's proven this point to him. He's showing him this. Uh, to, to help emphasize that Gentiles are to be accepted. But Romans 14 deals with this very topic. Yes, you can eat things that were forbidden under the law as long as it doesn't violate your conscience. But you must, you must be careful not to use your liberty to hurt someone else. So if you've got a Jewish brother over there and he is terribly offended that you're going to eat a piece of bacon, don't do it in front of him. Right? One cannot rightfully bind that which God is not bound. Romans 14, beginning in verse 14. I know and am persuaded by the Lord that there is nothing unclean of itself. Did you hear that? Let me repeat that. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is. That's conscience. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not in meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that is in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after things which make for peace, and the things wherewith we may edify one another. For meat destroy not the work of God. Right? All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. Paul said, you eat anything you want to. Because you know good and well there's nothing to it. You're not under that law anymore. But don't you dare eat it if it bothers your brother over here. And he's, he's, he wounds his conscience because of that. Don't do it. Right? That's our, that's our charity and liberty. We have freedom to do so, but we've got to be careful. All right? Which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving. I'm going to ask you a question. You may not agree with me. That's okay. What purpose do animals serve? Ours, period. They serve our purpose. End of story. 
I believe that us giving man given dominion over animals, which man was, and we could read that right now. Man was given dominion over animals. And I think that this means that God has man as the steward of all creation. All the earth man is steward of because man is the highest creature on earth. Man is given dominion over the earth. He can do with it as he please, but there will be an answer. Right? Should things be treated, should nature, should, should the world, should animals be treated uh, with respect, understanding that God created them? Absolutely. Absolutely. However, we've talked about this before. When it really comes down to it, an animal isn't evil, and man isn't necessarily sinning if man uses animals for his own, his own uses. Oh, I don't think you should have mice in cages putting chemicals in them. Well, nobody asked you. Because if man deems that that is beneficial to man, man has every right to do so. And you're not disagreeing with me. God says we're given dominion. Now, again, that might be to some degree unethical. And it might be something to violate your conscience. By all means, don't, don't observe. I'm not a huge fan of it myself. But I'll tell you what, if it saves my daughter or my brother from cancer by, by doing this, God's given them to us for that reason. We can do that. Should we be humane? Absolutely. Should we be careful? Absolutely. But animals are here for our purpose. Listen. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and the cattle, and everything that creeps upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing. He says... All of nature I have delivered to you, man. And I expect you to be the steward. Now, that's a big obligation. Does that mean that we should go bananas like these folks today and try to uh, prohibit and ban everything in, in worship of Mother Earth? Baloney. That's garbage. Should we be respectful? Absolutely. Absolutely we should. But I'm going to tell you something. The earth is going to last just as long as God wants it to. And we ain't going to destroy it. He will. Alright? 1 Peter 3, nine. Now, animals are, are to be respected. Absolutely. Animals are to be cared for, provided for. Absolutely. Again, I like puppies. I like all this stuff. Right? And I, I, I feel bad if, if ever you're ugly towards them because they're innocent little old things. However, animals are not humans. And they're not worth the same. The entire world of puppies is not worth one child. Sorry, just isn't. There is no animal on earth of similar or same value as a human being. Look at what animals were used for. Sacrifice, right? Exodus 29, 36. And thou shalt offer every day a bullock for a sin offering for atonement. And thou shalt cleanse the altar when thou hast made an atonement for it. And thou shalt anoint it and sanctify it. Now, who told them that? That's God. God speaking. And God said, you know these bulls that I've made? Do we need to go back to Genesis 1? I just read it to you. Every creature of the earth I've made. And he says, you know these creatures I've made? I want you to use them this way. Wrong or right? Guess who's wrong? Peter. Guess who's right? God. All right? Animals were used for sacrifice. Well, I don't think that's very nice. Well, no, you know, honestly, what you think isn't the same as what God thinks. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. And guess who's wrong? You. Listen. When the sin which they have sinned against it is known, then the congregation shall offer a young bull for a sin. Bring him before the tabernacle of the congregation. Leviticus 16, 16. And Aaron shall offer his bull for the sin offering. I'm not done. Then one lamb shalt thou offer in the morning. Exodus 29, 39. And the other lamb thou shalt offer at evening, and shall do thereunto according to the meat offering of the morning, and according to the drink offering thereof. For it is a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Exodus 29, 41. If he offer a lamb for his offering, he shall offer it before the Lord. Leviticus 3, 7. You know what animals were used for? Sacrifice. Is that okay? Absolutely. Listen. You can't worship God with animal sacrifices today. Don't, don't, you let, don't you let me catch you doing something like that to a puppy dog. You and I are going to have words, okay? But that doesn't mean it was wrong to do then. Bulls, lambs, 
These things were offered to God acceptably. Yes, animals were used for God's purposes for man, right? Yes. All right, let's keep going. Animals have been used for food. Is it okay for us to eat meat? Oh, boy. People pitch a fit, don't they? You know, I thought this was kind of funny, actually. Uh, that There were some people, maybe it was just a joke. I hope it was a joke, but I'd, I wouldn't be surprised. Some people picketing in one of the stores in the milk aisle that says, you're killing cows with this milk, and I don't think they really know how that works. The cow doesn't die when it gives milk. You know that? I mean, isn't this the ignorance that we see all the time? Is there anything wrong with using animals for food? No. You know what you would do if you were stuck on a deserted island with old, with old Fido after a couple of weeks? Something's going to give. That's okay. It might be hard. Now, I'm not saying we can't be emotionally attached. Man, that's fine. We should be the kind of people that are merciful and are, we're the strong, we have to protect the weak, right? I love it. There's nothing wrong with that. And to be affectionate towards an animal is great. But understand that an animal's purpose is not the same as a human's. They can be used for certain things. Genesis 9. And the fear of the Lord and the, and the dread, or excuse me, and the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast and upon every fowl of the air and upon all that moves on the earth and upon the fishes of the sea. And in your hand they shall be delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. They can eat whatever they want to. Leviticus 3. For the heave, uh, the wave breast and the heave shoulder have I taken of the children of Israel from off the sacrifices of their peace offerings and have given it unto Aaron the priest and his sons by statute. You know that Aaron and the priesthood, they didn't get a, a land inheritance. But you know what they did get? They had the service to the Lord and the children of Israel offered to them. And part of that offering was they gave them food. And guess what that food was? Sometimes animals. They got the best part. I don't know about you, I'm a white meat guy on chicken, and I like chicken breast. And guess what they got? They got the breast of these animals. They got the breast of these turtle doves and all of this. They got the good parts. You get the point. So I'm not going to read you Exodus 12 when they offered a lamb. Same thing. They would eat this lamb a certain way at a certain time. They were used for food. All right? Are any foods unclean to us? Is any food forbidden? No. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. By the way, Peter may have observed the dietary uh, standards after the law was removed for a while. That doesn't mean it was required. Remember we mentioned that a moment ago? We know that. I'm not going to read it. All you got to do is go to Galatians 2, 2, 14, uh, Galatians 2, 11 through 14, and you'll see that Paul says, Peter, why in the world are you telling people to live as the Jews when you live as a Gentile? You don't keep the law. Why are you telling everybody else to? You know what AD 70 says? Peter kept the law to AD 70. Guess who's wrong? AD 70, folks. Of them which believe and know the truth. Now this gets to the heart of the matter. We who know better can partake of these things knowing that they do not, uh, there are no idols, right? 1 Corinthians 8. We can, we can partake in this, uh, this meat offered to, to idols because we know an idol is nothing. We can uh, uh, eat with confidence if our conscience does not violate, uh, it doesn't violate our conscience in so doing. So folks who have knowledge can partake of these things. They know an idol is nothing. They know that the law is not in effect and that they can eat with confidence as long as it doesn't offend the weak. Romans 14, 1 through 6. I'd like to extend the invitation at this time this morning. Are there any here this morning that have never obeyed the gospel? You must hear the word of God and believe it. Repent of your sins. Confess Christ before men. Be baptized for the remission of sins and live faithfully. For those who have obeyed the gospel, are you faithful or is something not right in your life? You must repent of those things also and acknowledge them as sinful in prayer to God. He will forgive you as a erring member. And we can pray for you knowing assuredly that God will hear if you're willing to repent, 1 John 5 and verse 16. We're going to sing an invitation song as we do. We would encourage you to consider your condition. If any have need, the invitation is yours. Please come now as we stand and sing.